a few things, but we're still we're still working on happiness. Okay, what's so interesting about happiness is like so many different perspectives. It's incredible. But before we start with happiness, Talia asked me a really good question last night. So Talia, do you have the question? Do you remember what it was? Maybe you'll unmute and just tell us the question. Um. What's the difference between believing in God and or having and um, having confidence in God? Okay, so I'm going to say that out loud. What's the difference between believing in God and having confidence in God? So let me tell you, that's exactly the difference between the word amuna and the word bitacho. Do you see that? Okay, so the word amuna is I believe that there is God. Having confidence in God is that I trust him. So we can believe in a lot of things, but that second leap, that second jump, that second real show of who you are is the trust, is the confidence. Like I can believe, you know, you're my mommy and, you know, you mean well, but I'm not so sure I trust you're going to come through for me. Do you see? That's the difference. So it's the difference between Amuna and Bitachon. Obviously, the stronger your Bitachon, the more confidence you're going to have, right? You got to work on it, all right? You have to work, we have to not only work on the Amuna, you have to work on the Bitachon, right? So they always say this example, Amuna is like this little kid, you know, you know how dads do wild stuff? So they take this little kid and they put him on top of the monkey bar, like really high up, right? So, you know, and then the father says, John, you know, so this little kid, he like, he has a Muna that you're his dad and you really want the best. But for him to really demonstrate his trust, it's for him to take that leap. And that's not so simple. So that's what it is. Okay, Talia, so I hope I was able to answer that. So now I want to talk about happiness. And again, like I said, before we even started, there are so many perspectives and it's good for us to be sort of, um, investigating all of these different ways of looking at happiness, because we always say, you know, Yivdu as Hashem b'simcha, serve Hashem with simcha means Yivdu is an avoda. Really to find happiness, to live with happiness, it's going to take a lot of work. Okay, so number one, I just want us to know, like, you know, when we go, like, I don't get it. Like, why aren't I happy all the time? I want you to know you really have to fight for happiness. Home field advantage here in the world is body. And body has a great gravitational pull downwards. So you should know that we are lean more into being negative than we lean into being positive. And you can see that, right? Like, you know, when they have to put the news, they're always looking for the most terrible disasters. You never put anything happy on the news because nobody could care less for anything happy. They're really like gravitate. Like I find like people by nature gravitate to fetching. All right, that's what they say, right? You're gonna have this white piece of paper, shiny, beautiful, bright, and all there is is one little dot in the middle, tiny, that's black and everybody's eyes focused only on the black. Okay, so, which means like for us, heads up, we gotta work. So it's good for us to know that. So this pursuit of happiness is very famous. It's actually written in the Declaration of Independence of the United States. It's very important for us to look at that document because that document is the representation of democracy all over the world. It made history, right? We look at the United States as the shining star of democracy, the role model. And in its, right, Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness is defined, listen carefully, as a fundamental right, okay? Mentioned in the Declaration of Independence to do what? To freely pursue joy and live life in a way that makes you happy as long as you don't do anything illegal or violate the rights of others, okay? So let me just say that to you again, okay? So here we're saying this is, what's, what's the word, an animal? I can't remember the word right now. Like a right that everyone is deserving of, okay? So just by living in the United States, you're a citizen of the United States, I grant you the right to pursue happiness. As long as what? You don't do anything illegal, Right. And as long as you don't 
violate the rights of others, but you can go out there and pursue happiness with any which way you make. You want to have 10 yachts, you want to have 10 houses, you want to have 10 factories, whatever it is that's going to make you happy, you want to run after it, you want to gamble, you wanted this, you wanted that, you want to, you know, sleep around, whatever you want to do, you want to take drugs, you want to overdose on this, you want to overdose on that. If that's what makes you happy, you have the right to pursue it. A very interesting idea, right? As long as you end up on top with joy, right? So which could mean, right? Like I told you, I always had this story with this friend of mine who was uh, Nebuch, got breast cancer. And it was like, I think a couple months before her son's bar mitzvah. And the husband turned around and he said, you know, I'm leaving you for the secretary, right? And so she talked about how her friends were very split. You know, some friends were like, oh, that's terrible. And I feel so sore for you. And other friends were, get over it. Like the guy's entitled to be happy, <laughs> okay? So this is like these trains of thought. So let's like take a look. Like if we had to write our declaration and I'm gonna tell you a really weird word. I don't even know if we would be able to say the declaration of independence because we as Jews realize we are not independent. We are very what? Yeah, Esther, what were you going to say? I could see, like, I, you did a good job. So unmute, unmute. Dependent. Yes, on what? Hashem. Yes. Hashem. yes. So our declaration of dependency on Hashem would say not we have the right. In Judaism, we don't run around going, we have the right. I have the right to this, and I have the right to that. We use a very different word. Anybody know what the word that Jews use? We don't use okay. right. What do we use? It also begins with an R. So I don't have an answer to that, but also aren't we interdependent with each other? Like yes. Knowing that what I yes. do will affect the Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. We're very, okay. we're very not this I'm on an island on right. my own and I get right. to do whatever makes me happy as long as you know it's closed doors and windows. So right. We don't have that at okay. all. We're very interdependent. Okay. So very okay. interdependent on each other and very dependent on Hashem. And we do not look at our world as we have all the rights. We have the word responsibility. Responsibility. Okay, very important word. So if we're going to say it, we're saying it very differently. Okay, so for us, this declaration of dependence and interdependence is on Hashem. We're dependent on Hashem for life, for purpose, for meaning. We're, we're interdependent on others, knowing what I do matters, right? All of us are responsible for each other, right? If we're sitting on the boat and one person is drilling a hole under his seat, everybody goes down, okay? Right? And what I do affects you, what you do affects me, right? The understanding of happiness is a fundamental responsibility in Torah, right? Right? And what do we want to do? We really want to freely comprehend joy, choose joy, we have to choose joy. We have responsibility to choose joy, okay? Why are we responsible to choose happiness? Like Hashem says, I gave you life and I gave you death, choose life. So what does it mean to be responsible to choose life, to choose happiness? What is this? What does that mean? because we have the choice to make what's good and bad right and wrong yeah, so we... yeah 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 so when you look at happiness and sadness like you know should i live a life of joy or should i live a life of depression which one is the better life depression or or happiness which one happiness which one is right happiness which one is wrong a life of depression which one is true which one is false which one brings me closer to Hashem to my purpose and to my mission obviously joy right because what do we all know that when we allow depression to take us over what happens to us in all honesty what does depression do to you What's it do? It brings us down. We can't yeah. do any mitzvahs. We can't do, we can't do anything. Mitzvahs. It sucks your life out. You can't get out of bed. 
right? You can't function. So we're not talking here clinical depression. We're not talking here depression, you know, that is um, medically involved. And if it is medically involved, you have a mitzvah to take the, you know what I mean? The things that can help you medically to feel better. That is a mitzvah. Do you know what I mean? Okay, but we're just talking even on a normal everyday basis. Yes, sometimes we get depressed. We're not evil and we're not awful. What are we? Are what are we? We need to just remember. Hey, wait a minute. Let's get my mind reframed, reorganized. What is my responsibility in this story? Because the hardest part of this concept that I'm explaining to you is that the responsibility of happiness is who, who's. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So people spend most of their life, I'm being honest, looking at everyone else to make them happy. Right. You know, like when kids, like, like parents can only do so much. Like I really have Rahmanis, right. For all these parents now, like, you know, when school ends and kids are in between camp, you know, and the kids like look up at you and like, okay, so what are we doing? <laughs> you get something and they go, Oh, I'm so bored. Can you give us something else? Like you, hold on a little you know what I mean like guess what <laughs> I'm not your camp director I'm not your happiness maker you're going to have to learn how to make yourself happy very important right okay so when we do this okay so when we're going to make a free choice it's our responsibility to make that free choice right to comprehend what joy and happiness means like we have to have a definition here. Like when they're telling you in the, in the um, Declaration of Independence, it's like, go ahead, pursue it, which means what does that word pursue happiness mean? That's very different than choose it. Okay, what's pursue it? Pursue things that make you happy? Yeah, like run after run. it. Run. Right. It's, it's, yeah. right, it's somewhere. It's, it's, pursue happiness to me, honestly, sounds like it's something outside of me. Right. right? Am I correct on that? Pursue happiness. Like that's all of marketing, all of advertisement, all of business, all of capitalism works around this concept of you need to pursue happiness. Happiness is never within your reach. You have to go out there and look for it. And in Torah's perspective, where does Simcha come from? Oh, it comes from inside of you, your thoughts, your understanding. You have to put your brain to it. You have to be machshava. You know what I mean? Like it's all internal. Pursuit sounds very external, right? It's completely like, you see the opposite of what's going on here? We're saying this is internally our responsibility and the other world is saying, no, it's external and it's coming to you. You have a right. It's coming to you. And that's what it means where half those people said to my friend, like, your husband's got a right. So he can cheat on you whenever he wants. He can dump you whenever he wants. There's no moral obligation. Big deal if your son's having a bar mitzvah. Big deal if you were just diagnosed with cancer. What's the big deal? He has a right to just be happy at all costs, right? You see what's going on here? So here with a Taurus perspective is completely different. So it's a very different reality. So when you're unhappy, which most of the time, we kind of blame it on everyone around us. You know, I don't have the right husband, I don't have the right kids, I don't have the right house, I don't have the right body, I don't have the right, do you know what I mean? The Taurus saying, whoa, 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 you've got a responsibility to find happiness from within. And that's what we're going to try to figure out. How do we do it? So you want to choose, a, comprehend and choose joy and live a life in a way that makes, now this is very interesting, who you're dependent on happy. So we're dependent on Hashem. So we want to make Hashem happy. Why would we want to make Hashem happy? Like, it seems funny and live according to his will. This is so tough. This is so tough because the other stuff is telling you, no, you get to live according to your own will. So why is it that like, choose happiness, choose what would make Hashem happy? Why would I choose what makes Hashem happy? Why wouldn't I choose what makes me happy? So what's the, what's the answer, guys? You have to really think. That's what gives you purpose and, ah, and meaning. Ah, yay! Okay, Leora, so proud of you. 
right? Because in all honesty, what makes Hashem happy is what really makes us happy. So one, because it's purpose and meaning. Two, because you have a piece of Hashem inside of you. Your soul is what your eternal happiness is. Your deeper happiness is in the soul. So people will feel better, honestly, visiting the sick, taking care of the poor, doing a mitzvah, then they really will feel going to winners and getting a great outfit. True or false? Yeah. True or false? Yeah. True. What gives you more mm -hmm. lasting happiness when you do the right thing? That's when you really feel happy. Buying a nice outfit, eating a good ice cream, having a pizza with your favorite topping, all feels good, but very short-lived. Do you know what I mean? And usually comes with consequences. Like, why do I eat the pizza? That I, you know, like, look at how many calories I just consumed. <laughs> and every outfit that you buy, the next person wearing a different outfit makes your outfit feel oh, yes. joyful. <laughs> okay, Nobody can take your mitzvah away. Nobody can take your mitzvah away. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like a very interesting concept. It's all very important for us to understand because when we are down and out, we have to look to see how can we responsibly change that reality, right? So even in a secular world, they'll tell people who are very depressed, forget about buying things, forget about going to Miami, forget about, you know, a water skiing in the Bahamas. They'll tell them the best thing that you could do is do something for someone else, right? That's what they tell you. The best thing you can do is get out of yourself, Okay, okay, perfect. So happiness can be a very beautiful, wonderful pursuit, or it can be idol worship. And that's crazy, scary. Like people can, like the pursuit of happiness can become like an idol worship. So very interesting. So you want to know what the boundaries are with happiness. You want to know where you can get healthy happiness, balanced happiness, right? That's what we're looking for. So there's two words out there that we throw around a lot. And I'm going to give you this year based a lot on what Rabbi Manus Friedman said. And it, it wasn't easy. Like I was listening to this stuff going, hmm, you know, like it wasn't such easy stuff. So together we're going to go through it. Okay. So he talks about the difference between contentment and happiness. So he said that we, we inter, we interlace those words a lot. You know, we use them back and forth. So here's the two sentences. And I want to hear, I want to see from you if you can get the nuance, if you can get the difference. So one is, I'm contented to live in this house, right? I'm contented to live in this house. And the other one is, I'm happy to live in this house. What's the difference between the two? I think content could be like, I'm, I'll settle for it almost. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Janet. Excellent. So content is like, it's not exactly what I wanted, but I'll do it. Like, it's okay. You know what I mean? So sometimes like in our lives, like, you know, we get certain missions, we get certain posts that Hashem sort of assigns us, right? He assigns you, you know, certain things in your life. These are your kids and this is your husband and this is your this and this is your that. And you're kind of like, okay, you know, Shem, like I thought I would have gotten a bigger superhero, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I got him, you know? <laughs> okay, so, you know, I I'll deal, okay, I'll deal with it. Like, you know, I'm happy, at least I'm married, you know, I got purpose, I got my meaning and you know what? I'm going to work hard to make this work it's not exactly what I wanted, but I'm contented in that at least I'm married, I have a derech, I have a way to go, and I'm going to work on it, and I'll work to make it better, okay? So when you just say like, oh, I'm happy with, I'm happy to live in this house, then it gives you more of the impression that what? That what? You got what I, what you want. Yes. Okay. So it gives you more of that impression that you got what you wanted. Now, for contentment to work, it's interesting. He said you need maturity. You need a certain maturity to be able to be content. True or false? What do you think? 
True. True. Yeah, Esther, you said true? Yeah. Okay, so true. I think so too. So what is the maturity that it takes? What's the maturity that it takes to be able to say, you know what, Hashem, like, it's enough, you know, like, yeah, I could have wanted bigger and better. I'm willing to work. Like, it's not that I resign and that's it. I'm contented to work on getting what I need. You know what I mean? I'm contented to work on getting what I need, whatever the process will be, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm contented. How does that take maturity over, you know, I want it right now and I need it, and blah, 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 blah. So explain a little bit. <laughs> explain a little bit. You know, what, what's the, the light bulb of maturity that you have when you're like, it's all okay. Explain, explain. Perhaps looking at the, the good, I mean, you have a house and a lot of people don't have a house. So yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like thinking a little bigger, right? Like a broader, yeah. I can really do some, yeah. yeah. I may have lost you. Yeah, you, I lost you for a second. Are you there, Janet? I think we lost her, she looks frozen, right? But it's like, you have to have a bigger perspective and you have to be ready to accept, okay? So contentment comes with something that's a little, there is a maturity, like I feel very badly, like I, you know, I know a lot of people, like they're having trouble, but they're having a lot of trouble accepting the fact, do you know what I mean? And it's very hard for them. So they're very discontented. You know, the same thing, like sometimes you got to stick out a job. I once had a job and it was horrible. Okay. <laughs> it's a really bad job. <laughs> All right. And, you know, there was a part of me that just said, you know, to heck with this, I am going to stick it out till the end of the year and bye bye. Do you know what I mean? So I had to kind of be a big girl. Do you know what I mean? And just say, I'm not going to ruin my reputation. I'm not going to do something really wild and crazy. I'm not going to just quit. I'm going to take it till the end. And that took a lot of what I would say maturity. It took a lot of, I think I look at maturity as a concept of self-control. Do you know what I mean? Like being able to see there's something bigger here. Okay. So I think that comes with growing up. Like when you're a little kid, right? You're like, you can't have the gun. Ah! You have a humongous tantrum, right? Like, you know, you're kicking and screaming. So we have to, you know, as you mature, you realize, you know what? It's not the worst thing in the whole wide world not to have the gun. I can manage you know so i think it does take a certain amount of maturity at that you're able to recognize it is what it is and i have to deal with the cards that i was given okay and i think that's an important reality so when you look at two of the first commandments they're very important so one says i'm the lord your god and the other one says don't have any other gods okay so i am the lord your god is a very important focus okay like i'm the lord your god and you need to accept that reality okay accept that reality when you accept that reality then when i ask you to do mitzvahs and i ask you to not do certain things you can focus and be connected to with me right when you serve other gods what happens to that connection Okay. Yeah, it's broken. So it's very interesting. So they say like, when you do mitzvahs, you connect. When you do an Avera, you served someone else. So if like Hashem says, you need to keep kosher and you say, no, I don't. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm going to eat what I want. Then the Torah is telling you, you are serving something else, right? So sometimes what is that thing that you're serving? Well, you could be serving your lust, like, oh, I need to have it. You could be serving your ego. Do me a favor and don't tell me what to do. Do you see what I'm saying? It's very interesting. So when we do what we're supposed to do, we feel a connection. When we don't do what we're supposed to do, we feel a separation. So part of what we need to do is feel this contentment and this happiness. When we feel it, we can stay connected. When we start to go into despair and go down and beat ourselves up and all that other stuff, then know that you are disconnecting and you are serving. It's almost like you're serving another God, right? Because Hashem 
loves you. Hashem wants you to be joyful. Hashem wants you to choose that reality, right? So when you're choosing it, you're getting close to him. When you're choosing not to, then you are serving something else. I think it's like an important idea because you want to line up. Like many times we have a lot of emotions, okay? Like, like right energy and motion. And we have a lot of them. And sometimes, like, I'm not saying sadness doesn't have its place. It has its legitimate place. And don't think not. Like, right now, like, I think we're all, you know, we're still in the week of Shiva for Jody, And we're still, like, I'm feeling very sad. I'm finding myself just crying out of nowhere, right? Right? So those feelings, if I use them wisely, like, I can just say, you know, Hashem, it hurts. But not Hashem, like, why'd you do this? You know what I mean? That's a very big difference. Right, so these feelings of sadness, look at a beautiful neshama, but she left two little children, please Hashem take care of them. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Those feelings of sadness can still be very connective, right? It's depending how I'm using those feelings, right? But I can take those feelings and they could really make a huge wall between me and Hashem. And I can use them to serve my own, like I'm just down and I don't wanna do anything. Do you know what I'm saying? Everybody knows what I'm saying, right? You're getting it? Okay, so I thought it was just like, you know, a very interesting way to put things into perspective. So it's almost like two columns, right? I am Hashem, your God. I accept that fact or I don't accept it. And the second column is I serve something else. So we have to, to know, like, in other words, like when you're looking at your mind and you're trying to balance your thoughts, you want to know, okay, which thoughts going in the right column? Which thoughts going in the wrong column? Do I really want that? Right? I've got a responsibility to myself to make me happy and Hashem happy and bring his will into the world. Why? Because then the world will be happy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I'm looking at happiness. I can really spread it this way. Okay. So beautiful. Okay. So now. Okay, so again, so let's look at happiness. Okay, so then we talk about this happiness that brings you close to Hashem. And then there's this pursuit of pleasure that can bring you very far away from Hashem, right? So let's go into pursuit of pleasure for a minute. Give me examples. Pleasure pursuits that really just take you away from Hashem. And you should notice that when pleasure pursuits take you away from Hashem, they usually take you away from your authentic self and they take you away from your friends. So what are people today like pursuing in terms of pleasures that are really taking them off the, off the path? Jew and non-Jew. Gambling. Yeah. Okay. So gambling is a perfect example. Absolutely perfect. In fact, I mean, I feel sad to say this, but my house, Baruch Hashem, I got it power of sale. The house that I live in went power of sale. How did it go power of sale? Because the people who lived here gambled the whole house away. Okay, so there was a first mortgage and a second mortgage. I lived here and people would be knocking at the door asking me, okay, where's the people who live here? And I lent them money, you know? The guy Nebuch gambled his life away. He lost his wife, they got divorced. Everything went under. So that's a narcissistic pursuit. And what's so sad about it? is the world entices you to it, right? Like they have all these buses, you know, for $5, they'll drive you to the casino and give you a free lunch and blah, blah, blah. And they love to do it with the elderly, right? Because the elderly kind of, they don't have so much time. So this is a good way to kill time. And so they, you know, drive them over to the casino and then what? You know, you just keep putting the money into the slot, you know, pulling the handle and nothing happens. Right? So we have to be like, we have to be so careful. So these pursuits of pleasure can often be the biggest destruction, right? All of this, like the, the what's it called? The Netflix binge, the alcohol binge, the drug binge, like so sad how many lives are completely destroyed by all this so-called pursuit of pleasure and it ended up that's what Hashem's trying to show the world like guys I really want you to be happy I really want you to be joyful but I'm giving you a choice pleasures that are eternal that are just very superficial and not only are they superficial they're going to drive you mad right like right now, right? Like look at all the technology, all the social media, all the this, all the that. 
and then look at all the statistics and results and the depression and anxiety and all the other stuff that's come from it all and the addiction. So very interesting, okay? So when we're talking about what happiness is, you're looking for a much bigger definition. So when you pursue those kind of pleasures, it's never idol worship. You end up idolizing this concept of pleasure. And as much as you pursue it and chase it, it's always going to be one step away from you. That's how Hashem created it. If you have 100, you want 200. You want 200, you want 400. It's always like, like we say, it's such an important idea. Like if anybody ever watched dog racing, dogs are chasing a mechanical rabbit. And that rabbit is always programmed to be faster than the dog. The dog will never, ever, no matter how hard he tries, catch that rabbit. And that's the same idea here when you're chasing after all this like physical pleasure. And any of us who've tried it, know it, okay? <laughs> right, that it's just, it's an insatiable appetite. So very important for us to understand it, okay? Now, I want you to know something about emotions that are very important, okay? So sometimes like the joy emotion, when you're going through a lot of challenge and you have to stay very focused and sometimes you can't let your emotions in. Like if I had to look at myself, I would say the last six months, I couldn't let any emotion in because if I had to try to navigate with Jody through her life and what was going on in it, if I let any emotion in, what would happen? What would happen? You will feel depressed. You yeah. won't be able yeah, to bring able her. To, exactly. I would not have been able to help her navigate. Like if I would have let any depression, any joy, I couldn't let emotion in at all. Like it was like, shut off emotion and just do what you have to do. Okay. So sometimes in life, you will do that. Sometimes something hurts you so much, or you're so involved, or there's such a big challenge ahead of you that you shut your emotion off. What I want to tell you is it takes time to turn it back on. Okay, so I just want you to understand that. So if you've kind of like sheltered yourself from being happy and joyful because you've just had to stay so focused and now you're like, I want to be happy and joyful. <sighs> it's going to take time just to feel again. All right. And you have to cut yourself the slack. You have to give yourself the time. So everything that we're talking about, again, goes back to that word avoda, which means service. Service is work times one step forward two steps back one step this one step that so everybody has to know that like i don't want anyone to ever read this stuff learn this stuff about happiness and go oh, what's wrong with me i can't just flip a switch no you can't that's what i'm trying to say you really can't and that's what hashem is saying this takes work this takes thought this takes mindfulness this takes really talking to yourself and knowing yourself you know what i mean and give yourself the love that you need to get to where you have to get to right? Love yourself through the process. That's what Hashem really wants, okay? So we say happiness is very important, and Rabbi Manus Friedman said a good line. So the line that you always hear is, if the, the rabbis tell you, Eve do es Hashem besimcha, serve Hashem with joy. And Rabbi Manus Friedman said, look at it in a different way. Eve do es Hashem, serve Hashem. How? What service for Hashem? Simcha. Being happy in and of itself is a service to Hashem. So it's not just like every day, you know, whatever I do, I do with joy. Oh, laundry, yay! <laughs> Carpool, can't wait, going to soapies, woohoo! Which is wonderful. And it should be like that. Like my Shabbos candles, like I should be flying high with all these wonderful things. Yeah. But what about if I don't feel like that? Then no. Even just trying to feel like that, feeling like that itself is its mitzvah on its own. Okay? So that's big because sometimes we're not going to always feel like woohoo, but just the fact that we want to feel woohoo is already an incredible step, an incredible connector, an incredible mitzvah. Do you see? So, like, I think that's important for all of us to hear. Okay. So now it was very interesting, the perspective on basic happiness. Why should we be happy? 
period. Okay, I'm just asking you basic. Why should we be happy? Like, I just want you to know what the, the bottom line, like Rabbi Friedman is bringing out the bottom line of what makes us happy. And remember, anybody, I just want to hear what you think, and then I'm going to fill you in with what a greater, like more perspective. So like unmute anybody wants to just tell me, like, why should we just be happy? Period. We are happy because why? Because it's contagious. It, it makes everybody else happy. So it makes everybody else happy. But what is it? What are you happy about? What is it, Amita, that you are just happy about? The number one thing. Number one thing. I am happy because I am alive. Yes. I can, I'm alive. I'm alive. Oh, my gosh. You got it. Okay, great. Okay, Gabriella got it. I am alive. And let me explain this to you. Okay, this is big. <laughs> such, it's so funny. It sounds like such a Jewishy type of thing. I am alive and I got that gift for me. That's an interesting idea. I should be happy just because I am alive and Hashem gave me that gift for free just he invited me into the world for free i got invited to the party i am so happy just because i got invited to the party that's it nothing more not because i did this not because i got a gorgeous dress not because i have new pearls not because i get to hang out with the right club not because the food is great at the wedding i'm just happy i got invited <laughs> I got invited. That's amazing. Not for any reason. Not for what I did. Not for what I didn't do. Not because I'm related. I'm not just got invited. I got invited to the greatest party in the world. This world, Hashem's world. I got invited to participate in the world. That's like an amazing. Ever think about that? For free. For free. Right, my neshama got sent here, and then guess what happens? Hashem keeps blowing breath, right? Nishima every day. He gives me another breath every second, every this, every that. For that alone, whoop de doo. I didn't even do anything for it, just for getting invited. Okay, so I will tell you that the Medrash asks a good question, like it talks about in the story of Purim. Like, what was going to happen to the Jewish people in the story of Purim? What was Haman's vision for the Jewish people in the story of Purim? They were all supposed to die. They were all, all supposed of to them. Die. Every single one of them. Every man, every children, every woman, every child, every breathing Jew was supposed to be annihilated. Could it happen? Yes. Okay, more likely his success than even Hitler's, Yamach Shemo's success, right? Because Hitler had to conquer an entire world and Jews spread everywhere. And he had all the Jews in 127 provinces with an instant everyone taking their sword and Jews defenseless. So for sure it could have worked, right? So the, the question is, the Torah asks you, what did they do that was so terrible that they would deserve such an incredible punishment? Does anybody know what it was? Didn't they party with the okay. party? And very yeah. interesting. Okay, very good. Okay, Gabriella, very good. So some rabbis say they went to the party and the party wasn't sneeze. They went to the party and the wine really wasn't kosher. They went to the party and the food was supposed to be kosher. It wasn't so kosher. The rabbis give all these answers, but they say the biggest, biggest mistake they made was they were just so happy to be invited. That's all. They were just so happy that King Achishverosh included them. And for that, Hashem gave them an understanding of you wanted to be included. Really, Haman wanted to exclude you. <laughs> forever, right? but I saved you. So as happy as they were, right? What's our tikkun? Our tikkun is to be happy to be invited. 
to be alive and part of the Jewish people and part of this party called the journey of our lives. And that's where we have to be happy. They were happy to be invited by a flesh and blood king, right? Who really meant nothing and really was a barbarian. That's what they were happy about. So we have to stop and think, you know what, Hashem, you must think I'm very valuable because you invited me to this party and I haven't even done anything yet, right? Like it's interesting when you think about you celebrate your birthday and you get to be invited to people's birthday party. But in all honesty, what did those people do? <laughs> like, what are we celebrating? Did they really do anything? No, they were just went down like the uh, birth canal okay? <laughs> and came out on the other side. All right? And really that was God's help. <laughs> okay, some good pushes from their mother. But in all honesty, they really did Zippo. Okay, and yet we come to this thing, we're going, wow, we're so happy, happy birthday, happy birthday. Why? Because what are we saying to them? We're just happy that you are here with us in this world. We are celebrating that you were invited into this world and into our lives and into this environment. So that's what Hashem says to us. Don't think about what I did, what I didn't do, who am I, blah, 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 blah. Forget about all that. Like, I don't want you to talk about yourself. Just for happiness, say, you know what, Hashem? I'm so happy you just invited me to the party. Just the fact that you invited to me to the party. So that's what you say every morning when you say mo ani, right? You say, thank you, Hashem, mo ani, that you gave me back my neshama. But more than that, why did you give me back my neshama? Why did you bring me to this work? Because bechemla rabba amuna secha, you brought me back because you believe in me. That's what it is. Thank you for inviting me to the party because I don't even know who I am sometimes. I have a hard time believing in me. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, what's my big self? But you seem to believe in me no matter what. So that's where you should get your joy. I was just invited to this party. I didn't have to do anything. It's Hashem who believes in me and he brings me back and he keeps me here every minute. And if he you know, felt like time for you not to be at the party, believe me, you wouldn't be here, right? So here we know, like, Baruch Hashem, like, wow, okay? I am so happy. You gave me this all for free, all for free. It's like really, like, I don't know, it's so beautiful. Like, I think that that can be so helpful to us, right? And so you're invited to this party and now you're a guest in Hashem's house. So when you're a guest in someone's house, how do you behave? What do you want when you're a guest in someone's house? What do you want to do when you're in a, a, someone's house? How do you want to behave? Behave well. What? Say it again. Behave well. Be real? Be good. Be behave good. good. Yes. Why do you want to behave good? So that we are not thrown out. Yeah. <laughs> You're very smart, Amita. Okay. <laughs> so that's what it is. You want to endear yourself to the host. You want to show them gratitude. You want to show them appreciation. And you don't want to get thrown out. Right? And you understand that these people didn't have to do this for you. They didn't have to invite you into their home. They could have told you, go find a hotel somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? But they invite you into their home. So now when you're a guest, you want to do what Amita said. You want to be a good guest. You want to be a guest that endears you to the host. And you know what? When you have that ability to show appreciation and, and show how grateful you are, you feel very good, right? You feel very good. So this is what we have to keep in our mind. You don't want to be a miserable guest. Because <laughs> if you are a miserable guest, it does not endear you to the host, right? Okay. So we are just so incredibly happy and we are rejoicing because we were invited in, right? And we're invited to join in to 
this concept of creation. Like it's really amazing. Okay, beautiful. So I just want to tell you two cute jokes. Okay, <laughs> I couldn't resist. Okay, I looked them up online. It was just too funny. Okay, so this was these two little jokes. It's a commercial break. All right. Um, so it says like this: I was invited to a party. And I was told, like, you know, people ask you, like, how should you dress? So she said, dress to kill. So the person says, but apparently a turban, a beard, and a backpack wasn't what they had in mind. Okay. <laughs> Do you get the joke? Okay. Dress to kill. I thought it was very funny. All right. So on the next one, it says, I got thrashed for the RSVP I sent on a wedding invitation. So what did he send? He says, apparently... I can't make it, but maybe next time wasn't a good reply. Okay, now, all right. So I just figured like we're talking about invitations. We needed that little break. Okay, now here we go. Okay, let me see. All right, so we said that contentment is different. Contentment was like nice, not easy, right? But I'm going to make the best out of it. Happiness is it's amazing just because I got this all for free. And, you know, I'm overjoyed with that. All right. So it's the difference between contentment is okay. You know, I have to, but I'm okay with it. And the happiness is it's not okay. I, you know, I'll do it. It's I get to do it. Okay, that's the difference. It's not I have to, I get to, right? So it's very, very different. Okay, now, um, okay. So it's very interesting. Where does happiness really come from? Happiness comes from when you feel you're getting more than you deserve. That's a really good feeling, right? You're getting more than you deserve. That really makes you very happy you know people are giving you all these compliments and they're telling you how wonderful you did a great meal you did a great this and you're like mm, you know like me I don't deserve that and then you're like whoa <laughs> and you feel so happy okay so it's such a beautiful idea so that's what's going on here I am so happy because Hashem you invited me to the party I'm getting so much more than I deserve I did nothing you brought me into this world you have all this faith in me like whoa right and the more you feel that way the happier you, you are. So now flip it and see the world that you're in, right? So I was talking to a couple of people and they were saying like, it's so hard today to keep the kids happy in the summer, right? Because instead of thinking, oh, wow, I'm getting more than I deserve, you know, I get to get a Slurpee and I get to get this and I get to get that. Like, what did I do to get all these wonderful things? Kids are looking at it as... I should be getting more. All my kids, like all my friends are going to this kind of camp. I'm going to this crummy camp. You know what I mean? They're getting to go to see the Blue Jay game. And I'm like, what, walking to Max? You know what I'm saying? Do you see what's going on here? So you have to really appreciate that. So the more that we look at our lives as a gift, I was gifted. I got a husband. I got children. I got a house. I got friends. I got, you know, a class. I got this. I got that. I got this. I got that. Wow. And I didn't even deserve it. Like, what did I just do to get all this bracha? Like, imagine how happy you are. Now, what about if you look at it the other way? Everybody else has everything. Why don't I have it? I like, I'm so good. I'm a nice person. Why are bad things happening to me? I really do nice things then how happy are you? All right. So you see, it's really, it's tough. It is tough because look at the difference. You are living in a world that says you have a right. Today, you have a right to rob a store. As long as you take under $900 worth of stuff, you have the right to go into any store and pull stuff off the shelf and walk right out. In New York City, in California, you could do that. And no police, you have a right. <laughs> do you know what I'm trying to say? It's like, it's scary, okay? So when I'm gonna live in a world like that, that's gonna be very, very hard for me to ever be happy because according to that principle, I have the right to take even what doesn't belong to me. I have the right to take what's yours as long as it makes me happy. Do you see what's going on? Very scary. Now imagine if you live in a world where everything you feel like, wow, thank you. It's all a gift. Imagine the difference to your happiness. Okay. So it's like really a beautiful idea. 
Okay. Okay. Now, so where does this idea come from? Like, how am I able, like, I'm really being honest, like, we have to be honest with ourselves. So how is it that we would be able, what Nita would we need? What character trait do we need to be able to say, wow, it's all a gift. It's not coming to me. I don't, it's not my, you, you know, you owe me one. What kind of character trait does it take to be able to say, wow, you know, I'm, I'm not really deserving of all this bracha. I could never thank Hashem just for my eyes. I could never thank Hashem for my fingers. I could never, like all this stuff that he's given me, how could I ever be grateful enough? How could I ever pay him back? I could never repay anything. What kind of character trait would you need? So think. It's a very important character trait that we, they, they say you have to work on it. Like just to even. Is that kindness? Remember to Say that again. Second one. What did you say, Barb? Kind, kindness. You said something else after that. After kindness, what did you say? Humility. No. Yes. Humility. Hey, when you have humility, you appreciate everyone in your life. You don't look around and go, they're not worthy of me. They're such losers. They're nabs. I want to be with, you know, like when we were, you know, I, I met up with somebody years later after high school, like, you know, they wanted me to work with them. So I'm working with them. And it was so funny how she, like, she said, do you remember in high school, we were so clicky and this one didn't talk to this one. And that one didn't talk to that one. Like, you know, it was just an interesting reality. Like when you're in high school, you like, there are people who, did anybody have those kind of people in their grade? Yeah. Like they kind of looked at themselves as what? Yeah. Better than you. Better sure. than you. Do you remember those types? Like they looked at themselves as better than you. Like they always had their head up and away. Like they never gave you the eye contact deal. Like it was like, you're just like such a, you know, a, a little surf. Like I don't need to talk to you. You know what I mean? Like it was like, right? Okay. So when you have that kind of attitude, like I'm better, I deserve more, I need this, I need that, then you're really, right? Where's the humility? Where's the joy? Where's the this? Where's the that? So it's just very important for us to understand. So we can go through our lives and really just say to Hashem, like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, it's not that I'm a bug and I'm a nothing. It's not that I'm saying that. You've given me beautiful talents and I'm really grateful and you've given me things I have to work on and I'm really grateful. But regardless that you gave me anything, I, what did I do for that? Do you know what I mean? You gave me, and, and the thing that you gave me the most is life. You invited me to a party, that's amazing, you know? So it's just like, I think it's just such a nice, like beautiful idea. Okay, so let me see. Okay. Um, so humility is an important thing that we have to work on. No. Right, and we're gonna enjoy, and like it's interesting because when you look at the pagan world, like this like, concept of adult idolatry, like for us as Jews, you look at the sun and you look at the moon and you look at all these wonderful things that Hashem created, really they created, they were created to serve us, not for us to serve them. Like it's such a wrong spin, do you know what I mean? This is that concept of like, wow, look at all these things I'm invited to. Right? Look at this amazing party with the sun and the moon and air and water and all this stuff and beautiful trees and forests and you know all this stuff that Hashem gave. He doesn't have to make food with a million colors. He didn't have to make flowers with a million colors. He didn't have to make you know, today. If you looked up at the sky, it was stunning. Okay, every cloud looked like it's own, like it looked like it's so sad that I would say this it looked like a perfect picture. Okay, <laughs> really, <laughs> that came first, the picture came second, but somehow, okay, like all these beautiful realities that we really have to, you know, take pleasure in. Okay, so happiness is realizing getting, you know, more than you deserve. Contentment is, okay, I've got it. I understand this is what I have, and I'm going to work with it. All right, that's that pleasure we said if you pursue the wrong pleasures it's idolatrous so the question is when is pleasure a positive like when can we use the positive side of pleasure so the positive side of pleasure it's very interesting is when you believe you have more than you need that's a very interesting idea okay i take so much pleasure i have more than I need. 
So happiness, I have more than I deserve. Pleasure, I have more than I need. So you sit down at the table on Shabbos, you get all these like gazillion courses coming your way and really you're really full, okay? And then they come out with the most beautiful dessert that happens at Westmount. Okay, the most beautiful desserts, these schmancy cakes, I don't know my husband even knows their names. Okay, <laughs> like these fancy cakes that come at a sweet table and then you're like, whoa, that is way over the top. That's way more than I need, okay? This is like, woo. So there were times in Jewish history that, you know, the Jewish people wouldn't save any money. If they had more money than they needed that day, they gave it to charity. So like, it's hard for us. Like we're always worried about, you know what I mean? We don't have that kind of bitachon, you know what I mean? But that's what they did. The great pleasure was you gave me more than I need. Now I'll share the pleasure with somebody else. You know what I mean? It's just like, these ideas are such beautiful ideas. So I'm going to just end quick. Like I'm not giving you all of it, but I just think that they were very like, I don't know about you, but they really resonated with me. And I'm really so happy that we looked at it. Okay. So let me just um, finish with this, just a nice story. Okay. So it was in Russia, in Karlin, and there was a very famous rabbi who is the, um, hold on. Rabbi Aaron of Karlin. Okay, so he becomes a famous rabbi. All right, so Rabbi Aaron of Karlin, he was a chassid of the great Rebbe of Karlin. Okay, so it's in Russia. And in Russia, in those days, they had curfews. And if you were caught as a Jew in the dark, right, past curfew, you'd be arrested. And that would be the end of you. So this rabbi of Karlin, this Chassid, sorry, of Karlin, Rav Aaron, he's like really excited to see his Rebbe. Like he's like, I don't care. Okay? I'm just full of happiness, full of joy. And my soul is singing. Like I just can't. I have to see my Rebbe. So he's figuring what's the worst thing. He's going to take his Tehillim with him and he's going to run as fast as he can to the Rebbe's house and everything will be fine. So he runs as fast as he can until he meets a Russian police officer. The Russian police officer says to him, like, what do you think you're doing and he takes him puts him in handcuffs throws him in jail fine so he's sitting in jail and he says you know what okay I couldn't see my Rebbe but I got my Tehillim and he sits and he's saying the Tehillim and he's singing and he's so excited he's singing all these beautiful psalms and then suddenly the officer comes in and takes it away from him and the Rebbe from this Aaron of Coat Carlin says Okay, so I don't have my <laughs> Rebbe, I don't have my Tehillim, but I still have an opportunity. I still can sing and dance. And he's singing and dancing and he's so happy. And this jailer comes in and says to him, you know what? You must be mentally unwell. If you could be so happy under all these circumstances, you're crazy. And <laughs> he just lets him out of jail. And guess what? He gives him back the Tehillim and he goes to his Rebbe and he says, see, everything is amazing. <laughs> so what am I trying to show you? <laughs> this is the rabbi. This is the way. Like I got invited. That's all. I have opportunity. It's amazing. If I don't have this opportunity, I still have another opportunity. If I don't have opportunity, I have this opportunity. Hashem is going to give me opportunity. As long as I'm alive, for Hashem, I have all this incredible opportunity. And that's the simcha. And I think that's so nice. Whenever you start to feel down, pick yourself up a little bit and go, wait a minute. I'm invited to a party. I was invited to the party because Hashem says to me, you know, you're so special. Don't get down. There's so much ahead. You're so special. I love you. Such a nice idea. I love it. So are you guys all good? Everybody's good? Okay. So I'm not sure what we should do. Should we um, quickly say the Tehillim and the thank you prayer? And I will shut this off. Is that okay, everybody? Because I think it's just a beautiful thing.